I'm going to ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we come before you as we have sung and greeted, Lord. We've announced we've, we've had your scripture and the call to worship. We've prayed. And now, Lord, we want to hear that, what we call the message. And so I would ask, as we look at the lessons of Jesus and the way you passionately could not turn away from your heart going into Samaria and how you released your gospel to everyone. Lord, we ask for that same challenge. I understand we're not perfect, but we're going to be challenged to think about that this week, this day. And so Holy Spirit, help us be open to taking some risk. Help us be open to thinking about what it means to take a risk for Jesus. And as these words are preached, Lord, first, humbly, I ask you, with gratitude and expectation, may they not be my words, but your words. And Holy Spirit, may you remove those distractions in only a way that you can do that. And so that we are open to hearing you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so we look at these lessons from Jesus, and you and I are going to be challenged are we willing to be interested enough in our faith, interested enough in our own salvation to take a risk with our faith, to take a risk of inviting, to take a risk of getting involved? And the first thing that we're challenged to do when we look at how interested am I is we're challenged to get outside of our comfort zone. Jesus was willing to do that. He was willing to get outside of his comfort zone. He expressed that in many ways. One of the ways was going through the region of Samaria. But before I go there, I want to challenge us to get outside of our comfort zone. When I was first ordained and graduated from Bethel Seminary and passed my ordination exams and, 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 and the Methodist Church were appointed, and I was Kelly and I were appointed at the age of 28, 29 years old to two small towns in southeast Minnesota, Wyckoff and Fountain. One town had about 490 people, the other town had about 250. Their major business was agriculture, dairy farming. The reason I say that, I grew up in South Minneapolis, six blocks from Lake Street. Do you even know where that is? There's no dairy farms on Lake Street. There are a lot of bars. There's places they called massage parlors, I was told. There's not dairy industry. When I got to Wyckoff and Kelly, she grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the city. When we got to Wyckoff, we were like pork chops at a kosher wedding. <laughs> I didn't know the difference between a bull and a steer. I do now, by the way. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> Holy cow. I didn't know how to milk a cow. Now I've entered actually competition. Feel pretty good about it. I didn't know how to run a tractor. I learned how to do chisel plowing. By the way, I looked forward to that. That was like way cool. Every spring I helped a, a local farmer and I would get excited because I could get out in the field and help them with chisel. I'd like, what's the ground temperature, man? How close are we? And chisel plowing. I didn't know all that stuff. I had to get outside of my comfort zone. I even introduced the young people in that town to snipe hunting. It was fabulous. Caden, have you been snipe hunting yet? I'll take you, don't worry. <laughs> I had to get outside my comfort zone a little bit. Jesus was getting very popular, I mean that. In John's Gospel, chapter 3, he was getting popular enough where leaders, government officials were coming to him and having serious questions about their faith. A man named Nicodemus. He was getting popular enough where it would have been nice to stay in that region because people were attracted to him and they liked him. But the first thing that Stephanie read in verse 4, catch this, but he, being Jesus, had to go through Samaria. Sometimes the Bible was written in Koine Greek. Sometimes there are words in the language that the Bible was written in Koine Greek that don't do English words can't do justice for. 
When we read the verse, but he had to go through Samaria, we think, well, I have to go through Iowa, or I have to go through Green Bay to get there. That's just for Vikings fans. <laughs> We don't, we don't see that word had in the expression that Jesus was using it. Let me see if I can explain. Sometimes I go and I have a certain person that I want to help because my heart has such a passion for it, I can't resist it. I have to help this person because it's part of my faith expressing my passion to want to do it. Jesus didn't do this because somebody was pushing him out of a disciplinary action to go through Samaria. He went through Samaria because his heart would allow him, if you get this word had, his heart would allow him to go nowhere else but through the unwanted region of Samaria. The unwanted region that everybody else as Jewish culture had written off because when they were in exile in Babylonian exile back in the Old Testament, the region of Samaria intermarried with Babylonians. And ever since then, Jewish considered that region unclean. But Jesus had to go through that region because he wanted to because his heart was expressing to him that he needed to. It was a passionate had to. Sometimes... We, we get this card that I would like people to take, and we think, I need to invite someone. I'm a little scared, Lord. Help me do it. And we take the card because the passion tells us we have to do that. Do you see why Jesus had to go through Samaria? He didn't do it because God was disciplining him, because God was telling him, you don't do this, you're going to get in trouble. He did it because his heart said, I want to do this. And you and I are challenged to think about that. You and I are challenged to think, well, what does that mean when it comes to risk-taking this week? What is Jesus putting on our heart to say, you want to do this? But he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph from the book of Genesis. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. You and I are challenged this week, maybe at work, maybe at church, maybe at Sunday school, maybe at home with one of our children, maybe with one of our friends. We're challenged, what region do you want me to go through this week, Lord? What region do you want me to go through? And if so, are we interested in getting out of our comfort zone and becoming risk takers like Jesus demonstrated in this lesson with the woman at the well? Are we interested in saying, you know what, I'll be a part of that small group. It's going to require more in my life, but I'll be a part of that. Or I'll help lead that. It's going to require more energy in my life, but my faith says I need to do that. Often, we get times where we think, Lord, really? I was coming out of St. Cloud one afternoon from a meeting. The meeting extended through lunch. I hadn't had any breakfast. I was hungry. The meeting was boring. It was a bunch of pastors. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to get to food. And so I was heading back to Fergus Falls where I pastored. And I came down the street and, and I needed gas. I knew that. So I pulled my truck in. I got some gas. And right next to it was a Culver's. It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I was thinking, I'm going to be in delight heaven here. In about five minutes, I'm going to go get me a cheeseburger and a Pepsi. And then the world is going to be good. And as I was filling up with gas, this man approached me that had the smell of alcohol. And he looked at me, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, not now. <laughs> and he said, pardon me, sir. I was wondering if you had any spare change. And I'm like, Lord, all I wanted to do was eat. I did not want to save the world. And Jesus said, I'm not asking you to save the world. I'm just asking you to help one guy. And I looked at him, and he had the smell of alcohol. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give you any cash. But if you want, I'm going to go over to Culver's, which was right across the parking lot or the, from the gas station. You probably know where it is. And I, I said, I'll, I'll buy you lunch. He kind of staggered a little bit and looked. He said, That'll be okay. 
And so we went and I got him lunch. In fact, we got in there and I said, what would you like? And he said, you know, I can't really see that. He, he said it very quietly to me, very, actually very nice. He said, you know, I had a lot to drink last night. And I can't really see the screen. I said, well, what about a cheeseburger? Yeah, yeah that'd be good. And he started weeping at the table a little bit because he said, you know, nobody really helped me today because I, I have bad habits and people don't want to be around somebody like me. And I said, I get that. <laughs> but I talked to him about how he could get some help. I don't know if he got some help, but he got a meal that day. And we prayed together. And I got fed. There was nothing... God didn't stop me from getting fed either. And the day went on. All because we're challenged sometimes to get out of our comfort zone. We're challenged sometimes to go to that well and find out this week maybe, who, who could I invite this week, Lord? Maybe it's just a simple giving of a postcard and say, here, you know God, I know you're not in church yet, but if you just pray about it, here's a card to help you. If you have any questions, I'm not going to bug you, but if you have any questions, I'm here for you. Or maybe it's like getting involved in that small group because that's something that I enjoy, but it takes extra time. Maybe it's helping out in youth ministry with Mary Jane. Or maybe it's helping out in Sunday school too. Who knows? It's all about taking risks. And how do we do that? It's not that hard. This is what we learn today from Jesus. He exemplifies it with genuine simplicity. Jesus didn't take any classes. He didn't put us in some 12-week study course. He just said to the woman, Can you give me a drink of water? He just broke barriers that have never been broken. With genuine simplicity, he broke barriers. And at that point, the Holy Spirit took over. He didn't need a lesson. He just became genuine. The woman said, but you're a Jew. You shouldn't even be talking to me, much less be in this region. And Jesus said, no, I'm a Christian. Often I'm in conversations with people and they say, well, you know, I grew up this denomination and then I, I became a Methodist. And I'm like, you know what's really important? is you're a Christian. I love the statement. I love to say, you know, there's not going to be any Methodists in heaven. Did you know that? Now you're getting worried, right? Don't leave. Hang with me. There's not even going to be any Baptists in heaven. Now you're okay, right? No assembly of God in heaven. No Presbyterians. No Lutherans in heaven. You know what they're going to be in heaven? They're going to be Christians who happen to be Methodists. They're going to be Christians who happen to be Baptist. There are going to be Christians who happen to be Luther. The reality is, we don't have these barriers and we can put them away. The reality is, we have Christ to offer people and if we're willing to take that risk like Jesus teaches us with just genuine simplicity. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. All Jesus said to her, in verses 7 and 8, give me a drink. He just started up a conversation. You know, we're creatures of habit. If you look at the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 16, first of all, the book of Exodus is a wonderful story about how the Israelites were enslaved for so many years and God sent the leader Moses and had him exit out of Egypt, out of slavery, into the promised land. It's a wonderful movie. But you know what? They exited out of Egypt. They had a miraculous exiting. They crossed the north end of the Red Sea in miraculous ways. And the greatest army in the world was chasing them and got swallowed up in water. And even after that miraculous sign, yet in chapter 16, they started complaining and they started saying, this is too much of a risk. We want to go back to Egypt. When we're slaves, we had a better life. You and I, we're going to look at some changes coming up in, in, in Grace Church, in the ministry, especially in, in one of the worship services. We'll start looking at that. And we're going to take risks. We're going to say, we don't like that. I want it the way it was. And you and I are going to be challenged 
to say, what are we doing for those who aren't coming to church? And for the first time, we're going to be challenged. We're going to realize it's not about me. It's about those who are not coming. And we're going to be challenged to take risks and just say, can I have a drink of water? Just starting a conversation. And all of a sudden, you and I are challenged. So really, the question that we're left with is the title of the message. How interested am I? And it's really about our decision whether or not we want to get involved, whether it be at middle school or high school, whether it be at college at Ridgewater, whether it be in our adult world or with our grandchildren or whoever. How interested am I in getting involved? And that takes risks. This week, I read an article, once again, this is no secret, it's been going on for now a number of years. There are now two generations, minimally, that are saying, I, I, I don't need church anymore. Both uh, the generation of the millenniums and the next generation, too, before the millenniums. And they, they, it's not that they're bad people. They're Christians. They're strong people. But their, their complaint is they work six days a week. I get that. They get one day off a week. And church requires leadership action and energy and they they say I don't want to do that I don't want to put my life in that well the church needs people that want to be leaders that want to put their energy in it because if we don't change we're not going to make it and we need people that are interested in putting the energy even on their day off bringing their faith into action and saying I'm going to help this change and I'm going to help this institution become relevant again for people. What we need is we need risk takers. We don't need religious people. We need risk takers. And so you and I are challenged to prayerfully think about that as Jesus teaches us a lesson. Did he have to go through Samaria? No. He didn't have to go at all through Samaria. He could have stayed down in his area with Nicodemus and kept the popularity going. But his heart said, I want to be a risk taker. And you and I are challenged. We're left with that ministry as I read verses 9 and 10. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, 